That's what I talk about in my book, these seven pathways. Number one, find your fight. Number two, focus on the real prize in support of your why. Number three, live life as a learning lab in support of your why. Think and act like a business in support of your why. Own your attitude and effort because those are the only two things you can control. Learn to embrace uncertainty and find ways to navigate it because the ones that learn from each of these uh, little journey trips, uh, those are the ones that will find success. And then number seven, none of us can do this alone. How do you develop these road dog relationships? And, and, and the number's not important. It could be two people. It could be three. It could be seven. The number's not important. But you need to always surround yourself with men and women that will be truth tellers, that will pour into you in a way that inspires and motivates you. Even when they're giving you difficult news, they love you because they're doing it in a way that enhances your life versus take, take away from it. You're listening to the Black to Business Podcast, an educational podcast providing Black entrepreneurs with the tools and resources to start and grow their businesses. We chat with vetted Black entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and business owners as they provide tips and resources to help take your business to the next level. I'm your host, Monique T. Marshall. Having a sense of purpose in life not only helps you live a meaningful life, but it also offers a sense of direction. You become clear about why you do the things that you do. However, there are many people who struggle with one, understanding and knowing their purpose and why, or two, once they do know their purpose and why, they have a tough time being committed. There may be many factors that play into this, including things that are within and outside of your control. However, it's important to learn to control what you can control, focus on the process, and the end result will take care of itself. This is crucial for success. So here at Black to Business, we always want to make sure that you are showing up as your best self for success. So today we wanted to dive deeper into why knowing and understanding and committing to your why is important for success. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by Steve White, author of Uncompromising, How an Unwavering Commitment to Your Why Leads to an Impactful Life and Lasting Legacy. In addition to being an author, for the past 11 years, Steve served as President Special Counsel to the CEO of Comcast Cable, where he initially launched his career in 1996 as Regional Vice President. During our conversation, we talk about how he, in his words, was set up to be the perfect victim growing up in the housing projects. But yet, despite his upbringing and circumstances, Steve's unwavering commitment to his why helped shape his successful future. Steve is also going to share how to identify your purpose and pursue it with uncompromising ability, what an uncompromising life actually looks like, and how to learn to embrace uncertainty and find ways to navigate it. This is another good one. So let's dive in. Steve, welcome to the Black to Business podcast. So honored to have you here. So welcome. I'm so glad to be here with you today. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I always like to start with, uh, for those who are not yet familiar with who you are, if you could share with my listeners a little bit about who you are, how did you get where you are today and what is it that you do? Well, thank you, Monique. I appreciate that introduction. Again, my name is Steve White. Uh, Today, I work for Comcast, but let me just tell you a little bit about my story. I was set up to be the perfect victim. Single mother, raised four boys by herself, eighth grade education. Her first job was cleaning motel rooms, and that meant on the weekends we would go help her. So everything was set up for us to be a victim or certainly not to be successful. We grew up in the housing projects of Indianapolis, Indiana. We didn't know we were poor, but we certainly were. But I learned early on in those motel rooms the value of hard work, teamwork, family. And what I also learned, I didn't realize it at the time because I was 10 years old, my mother was living her why. She was living her purpose. And her purpose in life at that point was to ensure her four little boys were contributing members of society and that they had a better life than she did. And that's what she was ruthless in her focus. And so as a result of that foundation, And a number of men and women giving me a hand up, not a hand out, a hand up 
which is an opportunity to really display your true talents, the number of people that gave me a hand up has been tremendous. And so after Indiana University, I was the first in my family to attend college. I started working in corporate America, and that journey took me all the way to Comcast, where I was president of Comcast West. All of our cable operations west of the Mississippi, 30,000 employees, over $18 billion in annual revenue, serving almost 13 million customers. So to go from the housing projects of Indianapolis to working for one of the top 20 companies in America and being one of the top 10 executives at that company uh, truly has been a journey. And so I thought it was important that I share my story. And as a result, I have a new book out called Uncompromising, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, because my purpose and why in life is how can I help create a table of prosperity for as many people as possible? That's what my mother did. That's what the number of people who helped me along the way. So in writing the book, it's really a love letter to all mm-hmm. the men and women that gave me a hand up. Uh, and so now I want to pay it forward in a way that others might be might benefit as well. So that's my short story and anxious to spend some more time with you talking about my journey and my new book. I love it. Such a powerful introduction. And I love that you mentioned, you know, how you said that you were set up to be the perfect victim, but life took another turn. And today it's all about what you mentioned is why knowing and committing to your why is so important for success as you've seen. And I want to dive in a little bit further on your first talk about your book. Um, Can we dive into Uncompromising and a little bit more about what the book is about and what you would like the readers to take away from the book? Yeah, uh, uh, very, very good question. So Uncompromising, let me just first start with the title, because Mm -hmm. in our life, we're taught to compromise. We're taught to, to say, let's find a way where we all can sit at the table of prosperity and win together. And so uh, I'm not saying life is not about compromise, but let me just start with this quote. It's a Mark Twain quote, the two most important days in your life is the day you're born. And the second is when you find out why. So let me just say that again, because that's a, it's a powerful quote. The two most important days in your life is the day you're born. The second Second is when you find out why you've been placed on this earth. And that is what you're uncompromising about. So once you identify your purpose, your fight, the reason that you're on this earth, that is what you pursue with uncompromising uh, ability. No apologies allowed. You go for it. And that's where the title was birthed, this idea of being uncompromising and unwavering in pursuit of your why. So I I talk about this journey that I've been on and I share seven pathways to not only identifying your fight and your why, but then how do you stay focused on your purpose and your why? So once it's all done, you've lived a life of impact, legacy, and success. And so there's another quote I'll share with everyone. It comes from a song called Glorious. We all die twice. The day we get placed in the grave or a mausoleum, whatever your preference is. And the second time is the last time someone mentions your name. So we should all be on a journey that long after we're gone, the seeds that we planted is bearing fruit that outlives each and every one of us. So that's what the book is about. Finding your fight, finding your purpose, answering that important question, why you've been placed on this earth, and then how do you fulfill your real potential? So once it's all done, you've led a life of impact, success, and legacy. Woo! Now that is so powerful. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm so excited. Somebody better give me an amen. 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 (laughs) I'll give you an amen. That is powerful. I love it. And I wanted to mention that first to go back to your story and your journey of, like you mentioned, growing up in the housing projects and how your life could have took another turn. But I want to talk about, you mentioned your mother, how impactful her influence was on you. Go deeper into your upbringing and how that kind of has shaped who you are today, because I'm pretty sure someone is listening can find some similarities into their story. So how did 
your upbringing shape who you are today? And then dealing with, I'm sure there were some thoughts of like, maybe you dealt with like a scarcity mindset or how did you deal with all of these things? Well, you know, certainly my mother did not have a perfect life, nor nor have we led a perfect life. Mm -hmm. But there were some fundamental things. So let me just share this with you. Across my life, there have only been 12 decisions that have really mattered. I mean, you know, when you strip it away, we make a lot of decisions every day. We make a lot of mistakes. The key is don't keep making the same mistake. But the important thing is to get the big decisions right. So let's start with those 12 decisions. I won't go through all of them, but there was one that was transformative for me. Mm -hmm. My mother did not allow victims. Mm -hmm. And so once you decide that you're a victim, now you're trapped by your circumstances and you become a prisoner. So when you're not a victim, it allows you to think beyond what you see in front of you. We certainly saw poverty. We certainly saw, you know, homes without a father. We were one of those homes. We saw all of that. But by not allowing yourself to be a victim of your circumstance, you can think beyond what's in front of you and you can look to the future and you can dream. You can challenge yourself. And when you surround yourself with people that feed that positive energy, then there's nothing that you can't accomplish. So everything started at through my mother. No victims are allowed. Let we accept our circumstances. We don't have to live in those circumstances for the rest of our life. We have to recognize where we are and then dream big as we move forward. And so through those examples of working in motel rooms, and she graduated to become a high school janitor, and she did that for about 35 years, she Mm -hmm. never was trapped in her circumstances. And so I think that is the key message that I would like for people to take about my background and my foundation is no victims allowed. And then the way you keep and maintain the momentum, you surround yourself with people that are truth tellers who feed your energy, not in a way where they just give you falsehoods or they're looking behind rose colored glasses. Sometimes they give you difficult news, but surround yourself with people that are uplifting you because I promise you, you can put your friends into two or three categories. One is, are they contributing, lifting you up in a positive way or they bring you down or worse than that? There's nothing there. You're just, you spend time with them, they're friends, but there's nothing there. You're not being enriched by that relationship. So one is no victims allowed. Then number two is how do you surround yourself with, with men and women that are uplifting you? And so one of the ways my mother did it, she signed us up for Big Brothers. Uh, I was part of the boys club there in Indianapolis. Um, and so there were enough positive role models around me that kept feeding that. So, so that's how we were able to navigate our circumstances uh, as we move forward. And then once that light gets turned on because Monique, all of us, each of us have a little light inside of us Mm -hmm. and people come in our life and they make it brighter. Now there are people that can make it darker, but the more and more people kept making my light brighter, the more I start to believe. And right around my junior year in high school, college was not even on the table for me, but I remember several of my teachers kept saying, Steve, what about college? Have you thought about college? And the more they kept planting that seed, the more they made that light brighter, I started to believe that college was a reality. And I started to pursue it and realize there were programs out there to help people like me get to college in a way that we could be successful. So that's the message that I wanted to share because the book that I've, that I've written with a lot of help from a lot of people is not Mm -hmm. a business book. It is a life book. Yeah. I weave in business stories because that's been a significant part of my life, but it really is a life story about how do you lead your life in a way where you create a space that's better for others, not just yourself. And the more and more I found ways to pour into others, the more and more success I had. The more and more I gave, the more that I received. And I know that sounds counterintuitive to people, 
but mm-hmm. you cannot outgive. The more you give, I promise you, the more you'll get in return. Yes, certainly. And I want to kind of back up to one of the things you said is um, just going deeper into what do you think it means to be a victim? And maybe it's in your experiences, what you've seen as far as from other people and how can, because someone is listening and they're thinking, you know, maybe I'm just in a season where I'm just feeling how I I need to feel in the circumstances that are outside of me that are influencing my life. So how do I define if that's something that I can control versus is something that I'm, that's not within my control. Yeah. I'll share a story with you. I talk about my why and my purpose, which is to create this table prosperity for others. And I learned that from my mother, but I lost my way Uh, Because I thought my purpose and why in life was about me. How do I make Mm -hmm. as much money as possible? How do I ensure that my future family was never in poverty? And while that was important, ultimately, that can't be your purpose and why. Because most times, your purpose and why impacts others, not just you. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I had early success in my career working for a company called American Hospital Supply. I got promoted twice within an 18-month period. And I was leading a sales organization in the state of Michigan, and I got fired a year in the job. And my initial reaction was, this is not fair. I'm being picked on. Uh, You know, I did not receive the coaching. I was going to a familiar place of it's someone else's fault. But I got to tell you, the more and more I sat with the decision, the more and more I focused on my activity, while maybe there was a little unfairness there, I started to realize that I was contributing to my problem because I was not serving my team. I was not giving them what they needed to be successful. I was so focused on me and my journey that I was not serving them. So I deserve to be fired. And so that's what I mean by not being a victim. Certainly, maybe was there some unfairness there? Probably. Mm -hmm. Was it because I was an African-American executive and all my bosses were not? I don't know. Maybe. But I started looking at what could I do to Mm -hmm. make sure that this outcome never occurs again? And I focus on the two things I could control, my work ethic or my effort. And so I'm not saying you got to work 24 seven, but you know, when you look yourself in the mirror, did you give everything that day? That's number one. The second is I'm going to focus on my attitude. And when I need help, I'm going to ask for help. I'm not going to be embarrassed when I'm struggling. I'm going to, I'm going to go to people and tell them I'm struggling, but I'm going to do my homework and make sure I'm prepared. And I'm going to focus on my task with a positive attitude. So that's what we mean by not being a victim is I could sit here and blame someone else. It doesn't change the situation, does it? It's still the same situation. So how do you learn from it? Here's a quote, and I'll shut up. Uh, If you're not winning, you're learning. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure you probably heard from your mother. It didn't kill you, so guess what? It's a great experience. So it didn't kill you. Uh, So it's God's way of saying, I'm teaching you a lesson. And that's, I think, how you approach. Because every situation, you can get something out of it from a learning opportunity. And I talk about in the book these seven pathways that I believe can lead to a life of impact and legacy. One of those, um, number three, the third pathway is called living life as a learning lab. Embracing life's lessons keeps you alive and growing. Every opportunity is a learning opportunity. You just have to slow yourself down um, and reflect and you will find the lessons. Yes, yes, yes. And so, Steve, one of a couple of things you mentioned. So you mean mentioned kind of like some of those mindset shifts that you had to make, but also the power of mentorship. So for someone who is listening, what I'm gathering is that um, what you can control do and then look at those circumstances and surround yourself with people who are in alignment with those goals and those visions that you have for yourself. So you mentioned the power of mentorship in your life. How do you think that, um, well, what do you think makes a great mentor? 
Yeah, well, first of all, let me tell you this. I have more mentors than most people know, but here's the secret. Most of them didn't even know they were mentoring me. So because I try to identify men and women that I believe are living life the right way, whether it's being a father, whether it's being a husband, whether it's being a business person, whether it's giving back. And we know that we can't always judge a book by its cover, but Mm -hmm. we're all smart enough to see who's leading their life in a way that is positive. So I try to watch. I even watch the bad leaders because I learn what not to do. So identify a handful of people that you know, that you see on a regular basis. You can observe how they handle things. So build your own mentorship there and identify those folks um, as you, as you move along. So that's number one. Number two, if you do have a formal mentor relationship, here's what I look for. The first thing I look for is self-awareness because none of us are perfect, but when you're around people that are self-aware, that means they recognize their shortcomings and they're always in a pursuit to get better. That's a great example of someone that's living their life as a learning lab. Number two, when you watch them and you spend time with them, how do the conversations start? Does it start about them or do they start the conversation with you by asking probing questions about you? Not that they're desperate for the answer, but they're teaching you how to think about things and how to approach things. So that's a servant leader. I know that's an overused phrase now, but that mm-hmm. is someone that is interested in pouring into you. Um, number three, they let their actions do the talking. There are a lot of people that will profess and say, do A, B, C, and D. Listen to their words, but watch their actions more. Because if they're walking the walk and talking the talk, their actions will match match the words. So look carefully and understand if the words are matching the actions. And that starts to begin the process of a great relationship because that person is bringing a very strong foundation. They're self-aware. They believe in servant leadership and serving you and helping you be the best you can be. They actually take great joy in your success. And then number three, you watch their actions Mm -hmm. and their actions start to match their words. That's the foundation of a beautiful relationship. And Steve, what personality traits do you think contributed to your success? Well, humbleness, because when you're cleaning motel rooms, now let's, let's, let me break this down for everybody. This is motel with an M, not hotel with an H. There's no spa. There's no in-room dining. A motel is when you pull your car and you can see your door right there and you walk right in. There's no second floor. And I don't need to tell you, sometimes when people are away from home, they treat motel rooms as you just can't believe the way they do it. But when right. you can go clean motel rooms and clean up, clean up after people and have a great attitude, which my mother did, and, and work hard, that mm-hmm. humbles you. When you live in the housing projects of Indianapolis, you don't realize you're poor at the time, but as you start to get exposure, you realize all the things you don't have. That humbles you. That that keeps everything in perspective. When you go through life and you no one's giving you anything, you've got to go scratch and claw and work. That keeps you hungry. That keeps you humble. So, um, so I think this this idea of humbleness uh, and modesty is something that attracts people to you because you know how you know that old saying: if you got to tell people that you've got game or you got money or you've been successful, then guess what? Mm-hmm. You haven't been successful. How you handle yourself will send a strong message. So I could go on with a few others, but but that's a critical one there is this idea of humbleness and modesty 
uh, recognizing you don't have it all figured out and you're on a journey just like everyone else to live a better life, to live a more impactful life, uh, to make a difference. That's where humbleness and modesty really, I think, allows me to attract people to me. And as a result, I've never gotten promoted. People have pushed me up. People say, mm-hmm. Steve, how do you go from here to here? You're now president of one of the uh, one of the largest companies in America. The number of people that push me up, they force my bosses to take notice. See, I can't tell them enough how good I am. But when people are pushing you up above the crowd, guess what? The people that are making the decisions, they're going to see it. They're going right. to see you outside of the crowd because people are pushing you up. And do you feel like for those who are listening and they're knowing that there's a transformation that they're looking to make or need to make to get to the success that they want to see, do you feel that there are any key traits that can be developed uh, or that is not too late to develop to become an effective leader? Yeah, I always focus on what we can control. So let me talk about the seven pathways I outlined in the book. Mm-hmm. Number one is you got to find your fight. And people say, well, Steve, how do I find my purpose? Here's where I start. I'm going to give you three questions. Uh, and hopefully our listeners are writing this down. Number one is what do you think you're good at? You know, now get some feedback. Like I think I'm a good singer. My wife has convinced me I'm not. But whatever <laughs> you think you're good at. Some people are good at sports. Some people are good at interviewing people. Some people are good at writing. We all have a gift. I truly believe we all come in this world with a gift. And then it's up to us to develop. So number one, what are you good at? Number two is what are you passionate about? And number three, what would you do if you had to do it for free? Would you still do it? And I don't need to tell you, Monique, when you're writing a book, none of us are getting rich here. This is a love affair that you're doing. it. So when you can answer those three questions, then you start to look for the themes that pop out. What are you good at? What are you passionate about? And then what would you do for free? If you can answer those three questions and you'll start to find some themes through as you answer those three questions, that will set you on the path of finding your purpose of why you've been placed on this earth. Now, it's it's not an easy process. It takes reflection. Sometimes it takes people a year or six months or maybe even longer. Sometimes they've got to stumble along the way. But that's number one is find your fight. Number two is in life, there are a lot of distractions. Focus on the real prize. Let me give you an example that you can try. Build two columns. Put in the right column things that are valuable to you. Then, Monique, in this first, second column, put is what is priceless to you. Mm-hmm. So my relationship with my wife and my son, Stevie, that's priceless. So mm-hmm. how do I make sure that I don't lose sight of that prize? And that's why it's so important to understand your purpose and why. So now you know what to focus on because there's so many distractions in life. That old adage, look over here, don't look over here. Mm -hmm. Number three, live your life as a learning lab. Life is a journey. Find opportunities to learn. My stepdad, who's no longer with us, he was taking Spanish lessons at 75 years old. Who does that? Wow. desire to learn. And when you can focus your learning on your why, that's critical. That's why pathway number one, finding your fight is critical. Number two is focus on the real prize. Number three, live life as a learning lab. Number four, think and act like a business. And here's what I mean by this is, yes, I work for Steve White Incorporated. I'm chairman and CEO. Comcast purchases my services, and for the last 22 years, I'm very excited about that. But by changing my mindset, Jay-Z says, I am a business, not a businessman. I am a business. 
not to not to break off Jay Z here, but think about it. You're a business. You're a company. You're CEO. So how do you find ways to constantly pour into uh, your company? So for our listeners that are listening to this session, you're pouring into your company. You're here because you're trying to find ways to invest in your company, and you're hopeful that you this conversation will enrich you and help your company be more successful. Number five, you only own two things: attitude and effort. Control what you can control. I can't control people. I can't make people like me. Condoleezza Rice had a great quote. She said, if somebody doesn't want to sit by you, make them move. Don't you move. You can't control how they feel. All you can do is control you. Number six, navigate uncertainty. Because if you think success is a straight line, I'm here to tell you uh, somebody's lying to you. Success is never a straight line. It is always a crooked road. So how do you learn to embrace and navigate uncertainty? Because I promise you, you will impact you will be impacted by adversity and then number seven is commit to road dog relationships making deposits always yields big dividends so invest in people and you will find they will invest in you so that's what i talk about in my book these seven pathways number one find your fight number two focus on the real prize in support of your why number three live life as a learning lab in support of your why Think and act like a business in support of your why. Own your attitude and effort because those are the only two things you can control. Learn to embrace uncertainty and find ways to navigate it because the ones that learn from each of these uh, little journey trips, uh, those are the ones that will find success. And then number seven, none of us can do this alone. How do you develop these road dog relationships? And, and, and the number's not important. It could be two people. It could be three. It could be seven. The number's not important. But you need to always surround yourself with men and women that will be truth tellers, that will pour into you in a way that inspires and motivates you. Even when they're giving you difficult news, they love you because they're doing it in a way that enhances your life versus take take away from it. So those are the pathways that I believe that if you adhere to, it will give you a good shot at success. Amazing. I am so thankful for you for breaking that down step by step. I didn't want to interrupt because I'm like, these are all great snippets. So I really appreciate you for providing those. Stepping into, so your overarching message, one of the things you talk about is your overarching message. And you mentioned before is having that uncompromising life. So as you're on this journey, um, what do you think it is? If you could dive deeper into how does what does it look like to live uncompromising or be uncompromising? Is it does it involve pivoting if necess- necessary, or you know how do you deal with that pivoting? Yeah, here's I'll give you a story. Uh, I love stories. Yes. So good. think about this, Monique. Every, if you live a long life, and we're praying that all of us live a nice long life. Let's let's say we all live to a hundred years old. We're healthy, and we live to a hundred. Mm-hmm. Every day, Monique, you will meet four to five people, maybe at a Starbucks, maybe at the car wash, maybe at the grocery store. It might be a split second that you meet them or you come in contact with them. So now multiply that across your life. And so when it's all said and done and you get called home, as they say, mm-hmm. and there are 80,000 people. So let's say over your life, there are 80,000 unique people that you meet. And they're doing one of three things, Monique. Number one, they're cheering like, Monique, Steve, yay, you know, you boy, they they just, they're rooting you on because you impacted them in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Or the second is they're booing you because all you did was take, take, take. Or worse, Monique, the third is they say nothing. And that means you've lived a life where you've impacted no one. Mm. So the way you measure if you're on the right track is, you know, how many people you're impacting, 
You know how many people say thank you for pouring into me or thank you, your presence today, or thank you for the kind word you said to me in the Starbucks line. It really encouraged me because you had no idea what I was going through. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That is how you live a life of impact, legacy, and success based on the fruit that develops from the seeds that you planted. Let me say that one more time. Based on the seeds that you planted, Mm -hmm. you will see your harvest. And you will see if there are trees out there with apples and oranges and lemons and bananas. You will see your harvest. And if you can start to see in your life a harvest out there of these large fruit trees, you're on your way. That is how you start to measure your impact is the fruit Mm -hmm. that develops on other trees. And I promise you, the more seeds you plant, the more fruit trees that you have, I promise you, they will come and put fruit on your tree. They will come and plant seeds around your tree. So you will also benefit just as much as the folks that are uh, bearing the fruit. I love it. And Steve, one of the things I have to ask is um, you mentioned we've talked about your journey and we've talked about your story and how you spoke about college was initially on the table when you were in school, in high school. Someone is listening and they're saying, I know I need to make a change. I know it's my time, but there's that fear there. Maybe it's dealing with imposter. Who am I to be doing this? What would you say to someone that is dealing with that? Well, you got to believe it, first of all. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, Mooney, I have a 13-page document that I keep with me at all times, and it is my life's plan. Now, I'm not saying our listeners have to go develop a 13-page plan. It could be one page. It could be on a napkin. But what is it that you're trying to get done? Write it down. Because we know the chances of success increase dramatically when you write something down. So then once you write it down, what are the steps I'm going to employ to go make that happen? And then once you do that, identify three or four people in your life that you really believe in and share it with them. Because what that does, it does two things. Number one, you get feedback but you now have signed up an accountability coach. I have a kitchen cabinet. There are seven people in it. Uh, They're not all big, successful CEOs. Uh, Some are frontline workers, but any major decisions in my life, I run it by this kitchen cabinet, one to get feedback, but also so they can be an accountability coach. You know, for me, my wife and I, when we set our goals, we share with each other because we want the other person to be an accountability coach. So that's how you begin. Write it down, then be honest with yourself and say, what am I willing to commit to to go make this happen? And then number three is uh, you start to surround yourself with people that are going to challenge you and hold you accountable. For example, when I decided to write this book, I had to write down what was I prepared to do. And so during 2020, I had to block out five to six hours every week to spend time with my ghostwriter who helped me write the book. I had to commit myself. So I had to lay out a very specific plan on how I was going to go do this. And then I also had to decide, how am I going to get the word out? I didn't write this book just for my mother. I hope she likes it, but I want to share with others. And that's how how you and I are together today is, you know, there's some people that help connect us. And I had to lay all that out as part of a plan. So that's how you begin the process of uh, moving forward and starting to transform your life. Last point I want to make is once you set your goal, don't become fixated on that. Focus on the process that would allow you to reach your goal. So let me just do something really silly. Let's say you want to lose 10 pounds or 20 pounds or you want to go get your college degree or whatever. Mm-hmm. You start, You what is the process to go do that? And then you focus on the process and the end result will take care of itself. So if you say, I want to go to college, okay, what are the steps I'm going to put in place so I can go to college? 
first thing is I need to figure out what where I'm going to get financial aid. Uh, what is going to be my major? What do I want to focus on? How much time am I willing to commit to it? Now, does that mean I go full-time or does it mean I go part-time? Does it mean I go at night or does it mean I go in the morning? Mm-hmm. So those are all decisions you have to make. And then once you make the decision, then focus on the process, which then allows you to reach your goal. This is so awesome. So now someone is listening and they're like, I know how to get clear on my why. I know how to find my purpose. Um, And then you talked about uh, having that accountability, those people who hold you accountable. Um, Are there any more tips that you have on staying disciplined and maybe for someone who struggles with dealing with procrastination and things like that? Well, I think the accountability coach um, goes a long way. But, you know, let me start with this question. If I knew I couldn't fail, what would I go do? Mm-hmm. See, because I have a nine-year-old son. He thinks he can do everything. You know, I have to like pull him back because they have this childlike belief that there's nothing they can't do. But what happens is over time, only people beat it out of us, not yes. literally, but figuratively yes. through negative comments or you can't do this or, or whatever. Yeah. So that's where you start is you, you ask yourself, if I knew I couldn't fail, what would I go do? And then number two, take an inventory of who you're spending your time with. If you're spending time with people that are not contributing in a positive way, be honest with yourself. And so that's why I'm sure there are other parents like me. We go out of our way to encourage our son. Now, we try to keep it in boundaries, right, where, you know, if he says, hey, I want to be an NBA player, we don't discourage him. We talk about, okay, let's talk about that. What is the process, if that's truly what you want to do, that you've got to go through? Mm -hmm. And how do you go, you know, let's focus on the process. So while at the same time highlighting for him the numbers that look, Stevie, you know, the number of people that make it to the NBA is one in a million or one in 500,000. So let's look at the odds of that. I'm not saying you can't do it, but let's understand the odds. And if the odds are there, wouldn't it be great to have some some alternatives for whatever reason? Mm-hmm. And so now you're encouraging, but at the same time, you're trying to provide some pra- practical application to that dream, not in a discouraging way, but helping them figure out how they can do it. So I think that I think that's where you have to start. You have to start taking an inventory of who you're spending your time with. And I promise you, there are men and women in your life that are not contributing in a positive way. Then you have to make the tough decision. Am I going to live my life for them or am I going to live my life for myself? And that's happened to me. I've had people that I really enjoy being around, but at the end of the day, they really were not adding anything of value. Perfectly said. Steve, this has been so amazing. Someone is listening, and I know that you've broken down a lot of the things in the book, and the book is available now. Can you tell people where they can get the book? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that question. First of all, if you want to learn more about the book, you want to learn more about me, if you want to follow me on social media, please go to my website, stevewhitespeaks.com. Let me say that again, stevewhitespeaks.com. If you go in, there's a lot of articles. There are other things that as you determine your path forward, I believe you can benefit from that. And wherever you buy books, if you buy them from Amazon, if you buy from Barnes and Nobles, you can go online. The book is available. It was released on March 8th this year, 2022, and it's available in hardcover. It's it's available in ebook, and there's also an audio version. So whatever works for you, my hope is you will uh, look up the book, you will purchase the book. And if you find yourself moved or inspired, please share it uh, with others. Please pay it forward and buy them a book uh, because I truly believe you will be impacted by this book in a positive way. And thank you for listening today. Oh, yes. And I'll be sure to include the book link in the show notes for those who are listening so you can have direct access to it. And then also, Steve, this has been amazing. So I'm sure people who are listening are entrepreneurs or thought leaders are wondering, what are some of the tools and resources that have really helped you in your journey? 
Well, I think uh, I think reading is such a critical thing. I, I remember hearing Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, and I think if not the richest man in, in America, certainly in the top four or five, mm-hmm. uh, whenever he was struggling with an item, he would buy 12 books. He would go out and seek advice from others on great books. And he would read 12 books a year, one book per month. I don't think that's a big task. Find a book that's 200 pages. You can read, you know, 10 pages a day and you're, you'll finish in a month. Uh, but he would identify 12 books on a subject and he would commit himself to reading 12 books a year. Sometimes it was faster, but you want to make sure it's manageable. And so that is probably the most valuable tool um, you know, that you can use, or it might be find 12 podcasts. It might be find 12 radio shows or TV show, whatever it is, but educate yourself, live life as a learning lab. And that's what I found is when I was struggling with something, I searched and found books that would allow me to become smarter on an item. And I found that that had a huge impact in a positive way. Love it. And Steve, what would you say is the big, the best risk that you've taken for yourself? The biggest risk? The best. Oh, the best risk, um, you know, was, um, you know, when I got fired, you know, when you're at your lowest point, Monique, it's hard to trust anyone because you feel so let down. And the day I got fired from my job at American Hospital Supply that really set me on my path, I received a call from Darnell Martin, who's no longer with us. He was working in another part of the company. Mm -hmm. He said, Steve, I see more in you than you see in yourself. But if you continue to lead the way you're leading, you won't enjoy success. So I don't have a job for you, but I'm going to move you from Michigan to Chicago. You're going to work on special projects. And I'm just going to allow you to watch us and how we lead and how we drive the business forward. And so at that time, at my lowest point, I had to quickly trust Darnell to move myself to Chicago without really a job, still on the payroll, but working for him, doing special projects. That was a critical moment where I had to trust, and that was a big risk. Now, as I reflect on it, it was a big risk Mm -hmm. um, because I could have just wallowed in my pity. I could have said, no, I don't want to be part of this company anymore. I could have really played that victim versus I looked at it as an opportunity and a hand up, not a hand out. And boy, I'm so glad I did. That was a big risk that really paid off for me. Love that. And Steve, what does it mean to you to be black in business? Well, I, I highlight in my book, I call it thriving through my exhaustion. I'll, I'll go quick. I'll do it from two perspectives. Uh, I had to recognize that it was exhausting me, but then I had to embrace it. So number one, being black in corporate America is difficult because oftentimes there's only a few of you there. Now, again, back to my mom, let's not be trapped by our circumstances. Let's look forward. Let's think about how you can create an opportunity for other people of color to come behind you and come with you. So that was exhausting because there were there were, let's be honest, there were people who didn't believe in me. There were people Mm -hmm. that judged me uh, based on the color of my skin and nothing else. And, And while I didn't have a lot of direct uh, racist acts directed to me. It was more subtle, uh, mm-hmm. like going into the shop, into the into the uh, department store, and somebody's watching you or following you. That's you know, those are subtle little ways that people send a message that maybe you're not wanted here. But also, the other part of my exhaustion, Monique, is in the African American community when you have accomplished a certain level of success, there is a belief in a responsibility that you need to bring others along 
that there were others before you. In some cases, they died. They marched in Selma, Alabama. They, they got locked up because they were protesting injustice. So they created the space for you. And it is your responsibility to bring others along. That's a lot of pressure, not only to work for yourself, but sometimes feel that you're bringing the whole race along with you. That can be exhausting as well. So I talk about this exhaustion about being black in America. It comes from two perspectives. One, is maybe there's some people that don't really want you there, but then there's this expectation that, look, Steve, you've accomplished a certain level of success. You better mm-hmm. bring others along. And so why I believe that, that's a heavy burden to carry if you understand what I'm saying. Some people mm-hmm. call it survivor's remorse. So there were two levels of exhaustion, but I learned to embrace each of those. And I, in my opening chapter of the book, I talk about thriving in my exhaustion. While exhausting, uh, I found ways to embrace it and thrive in it. And so as a result of my contributions, the number of uh, people of color in senior positions in Comcast um, is very impressive, Uh, even to the point that my replacement, uh, Rich Jennings, is an African-American leader. Now, how many African-American leaders get to replace themselves with another African-American leader? So while we all believe we can do more, uh, the goal is go do something and make a difference. And so find a way to thrive in your exhaustion. Love it. Steve, this has been so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, if you could just give the people once more how they can find you on social media, support you and learn more about you. Great. First of all, let me just say, I love what you're doing. Thank you. Black to business. I love it. Uh, Go to Steve White, go to stevewhitespeaks.com. All the information on the book, me, how to follow me on social media. Uh, Please go to stevewhitespeaks.com and go buy the book. (laughs) Yes, certainly. Steve really broke it down for us. He gave us the blueprint and seven pathways to lead a life of impact and legacy. Some of the things that resonated with me during this conversation is that there are so many distractions in life, so it's really important to know what to focus on. When it comes to making decisions, it's essential to get the big decision right. And most importantly, we cannot be trapped by our circumstances, but instead we must learn to navigate them. Remember, control what you can control. Thank you so much for listening. And as Steve said, continue to live your life as a learning lab. Once you've identified your purpose and why, pursue it with uncompromising ability. We appreciate you so much for listening and visit blacktobusiness.com forward slash 90 to learn more about Steve as well as the full show notes. Chat with you next week.